Thanks very much, Daniel, and uh, welcome everybody. Um, this talk is situated in an area of applied linguistics uh, that we might call political linguistics or critical discourse analysis. And this type of linguistics um, uh, fundamentally may be described as seeking to uh, examine and expose uh, the ideological workings of uh, linguistic representation. And we're going to be looking at this today in the context of the uh, of political protest. And, and so we'll be exploring the kind of linguistic representations that we find in media coverage of political protest. And toward the end of the talk, uh, I'm hoping there'll be time. Uh, I've also got a couple of examples of um, images of, of political protest that, that are relevant as well. Um, so I think perhaps the, the, the most sensible place to start here is actually not in linguistics, um, but in, in media studies, uh, and uh, to highlight something known as the protest paradigm. Uh, the protest paradigm is um, a, a, a long observed pattern of media reporting in which news texts focus on the disruptive or the destructive nature of political protests. Uh, rather than, or while ignore, rather than, or while ignoring the conditions, the structural societal conditions, and the causes which motivate um, political protests, and this uh, pattern of media representation, it's argued, serves uh, very often to depoliticize protests, often criminalizing them instead, or in some other way delegitimizing political protests, so that they're no longer seen as um, uh, as legitimate acts of political expression uh, or expressions of political discontent, um, but as criminal acts. And this in turn uh, may justify uh, the excessive use of force that we find in state responses to political protests. Now, this pattern of uh, reporting is manifested in general framing patterns um, but all, uh, as in the sort of content of the coverage, but also in the details of linguistic structure, including in lexical choice, grammatical choices and metaphors. And it's this uh, micro level um, uh, analysis of linguistic structure that, that uh, critical discourse analysis or political linguistics is interested in. And this is what makes the kind of analysis we'll be offering uh, today different to the kind you might find in uh, media studies. Um, so just to give you a, a, a kind of a glimpse of, of, the, of the types of, uh, of, of linguistic structure uh, that we're interested in, uh, here's a montage of, of uh, news reports covering political protests. Some of these examples we'll come to uh, in the course of uh, this talk. But I want to start um, with a, a protest that happened on Saturday, um, and um, I'm sure if any of you have been following the news, uh, you'll be familiar with this, pro with this protest and, and the consequences of it, um, uh, and and what it what it was about. Uh, but the reason I'm highlighting this is, is to show you just the, uh, the the importance of language um, in reporting political protests. <clears throat> and here on this slide, for example, is the initial response of the BBC. Uh, to the protests that took place on Saturday. Sarah Everard, confrontation uh, with police at unsafe vigil. Now, the relationship between the press and the public, as well as the, uh, the press and government, is a complicated one. Um, uh, we don't simply consume information, but pr the press also respond um, to, uh, uh, to the public mood and sensing the public mood around this protest. Um, later on the same day, the BBC, in fact, changed the headline in the same news story at the same URL, uh, but they changed uh, the uh, sensing the public mood. They changed the headline to police clash with women at Clapham Vigil, no longer drawing attention uh, in the context of COVID to, to, to the protest being unsafe um, uh, and instead focusing more on uh, violence with the, acknowledging the role of, of, of the police here. Notice, though, that in the verb clash, they they still ascribe some uh, violence uh, to the uh, to the women protesting at what was um, an otherwise peaceful protest. So still delegitimizing the events in some way. 
Um, <clears throat> okay, an outline of the talk today then. I'm going to focus more technically on, on verb choices, grammatical choices and uh, metaphors. Um, and I'll take these in turn. So let's think about verb choices first. And I, I'd, I'd like you to just take a look. I won't ask you to read it all, um, but just to, to look at the headline figure uh, in this coverage of uh, the Black Lives Matter movement, uh, the Black Lives Matter protests in the UK, and specifically the events that unfolded in Bristol um, around the, the statue of Edward Colston. Um, so the Mail Online writes, Black Lives Matter protests tear down Bristol statue of 17th century slave trader and philanthropist Edward Colston. What's significant here, particularly when we compare it to the subsequent slide um, from The Guardian, is the choice of verb in tear down. And we see these kinds of verbs repeated, um, tear down, throw, torn down, uh, torn down, heaving the metal monument down uh, with ropes. These verbs all serve to sort of highlight uh, the, the, dis the violent and the destructive nature of these protests. But if we can, and in that sense, this newspaper uh, sort of delegitimizes um, uh, the efforts of these uh, protesters. But if we compare that to The Guardian, and we look at, uh, which has a very different ideological perspective, particularly on um, political protests, the choice of the verb is markedly different. Here we find um, uh, BLM protesters toppling the statue of slave trader Ed Colston. And when we, and we don't find them tearing down, um, but pulling down, which relates only to motion rather than um, to force. But it's toppling that I think is most interesting here. Uh, uh, pulling it and rolling it down as opposed to heaving it down also uh, only relates to, to movement rather than uh, to force such as heaving and throwing. But it's topple that is most interesting um, and topple I think lends um, a degree of legitimacy um, to, to these actions because topple is associated um, with, with, with bringing down um, dictatorships or other governmental regimes and in that sense topple uh, remain keeps the protests within the political realm and doesn't transfer them uh, to the violent or criminal. So in The Guardian we do not find a depoliticization of these actions. We might ask, how do we know this about a verb like topple? And we can look for evidence of, of this interpretation uh, by consulting a general um, corpus of English. This will be very, very small on your screen. But what you find is the kind of things that get toppled are the Thatcherite government or, um, or other presidencies or other leaders um, around the world. So when we look at the way that topple behaves in a general corpus of English, we can see that topple is associated with political contexts. Um, <clears throat> so the, the, uh, the, the use of topple in The Guardian maintains that political link of the protests uh, in a way that the Daily Mail doesn't. Um, we can also look at uh, the grammatical properties um, of uh, of different verbs or verb types. And here I want to distinguish, we'll make a distinction between transitive verbs, something you're probably familiar with if you're doing GCSE or, or uh, A-level English language, and reciprocal verbs. Reciprocal verbs are verbs that come with the preposition with. So you get things like clashed with, collided with, and so on. Uh, this is looking back at a protest in 2010, uh, protesting against rises in university tuition fees. Uh, and if we look at uh, from the from the Telegraph here, a newspaper on the right of the political spectrum, um, we find transitive verbs like attack. So a number of police officers were injured. And then in, in this clause, after they came under attack from youths, some wearing scarves to hide their faces amid scenes of chaos. Now, if we compare that again uh, with The Guardian as a newspaper on the left of the political spectrum, um, we find a shift in the verb so that here we get uh, police wielding buttons clashing with a crowd hurling placard sticks, eggs and bottles. So these are two different newspapers reporting on exactly the same events. They're both focused on the violent altercations um, that unfolded. But there is a marked difference in the verb, uh, with the Telegraph preferring to use a transitive verb and the Guardian preferring to use a reciprocal verb. 
You also get this repeated in The Guardian, activists who had masked their um, faces with scarves traded punches with police to chance of Tory scum. So what's the difference in meaning between a transitive and a reciprocal verb? Uh, well, in an area known as cognitive linguistics, we, we try to diagram the meanings um, uh, as, their, uh, as, as representations of the meaning in the mind. And a transitive verb uh, it, it invokes what we call a one sided action frame that's represented in the diagram here, where an agent, the doer of an action, um, perform some action on a patient who's the undergoer of the action. Uh, but a reciprocal verb doesn't involve an agent and a patient, but two agents, uh, both participants in the event, in this case the police and the protesters, are activated or agentive in um, the transfer of force in this, in this violent clash. And we call this a two-sided action frame. One of the things that this difference does is, uh, this linguistic difference does, is serve to apportion blame uh, in different ways. So in the transitive verb where the protesters are the agent in protesters attacking police, protesters are more likely, uh, pr or protesters are assigned sole blame for the violence that ensued. Whereas in reciprocal verbs, it distributes blame more equally. Both parties are to blame as violent actors in those interactions. And that sort of analysis is actually borne out experimentally. Uh, if you present participants with one or other of these different formulations, then those um, uh, presented with the transitive verb are more likely to assign blame um, to the protesters, whereas those presented with a reciprocal verb are more likely to assign blame equally between police and protesters. Um, let's move to another uh, discursive context, this time internationally, um, and here I'm uh, looking at protests that took place on the Gaza border um, as part of something called the Great March of Return. What we're interested in linguistically here is not the difference between transitive and reciprocal verbs, but the difference between transitive and intransitive verbs. So what you see here um, at this event, by the way, a number, a number of Palestinian protesters were, were killed um, at the hands of um, Israeli uh, soldiers. Um, so this is from the NBC uh, and you get Israeli forces hats and here we have the active voice have killed more than 100 demonstrators. And then in the passive voice, at least 58 Palestinians were killed uh, by Israeli forces. So in the NBC, we have uh, the use of a transitive verb. Um, this is significant significant because it explains how the deaths of uh, the Palestinian uh, protesters came about. If we contrast that um, with the New York Times, um, uh, then you find this. At least 28 Palestinians die uh, in protests as US prepares to open Jerusalem embassy. So in the verb die, in contrast to killed, this is what we call an intransitive verb. Uh, and it's ideological because no explanation is provided as to exactly how the Palestinian uh, protesters came to die. Um, it leaves open the possibility, for example, that they all happened to spontaneously combust or that they all collapsed en masse of sudden heart attacks. Of course, we know that's not the case, but the linguistic representation doesn't make explicit um, that they died at the hands of um, Israeli soldiers. So what we find here uh, in the transitive verb, uh, the, the meaning, the, the meaning side of of, of the grammatical uh, uh, property of the verb, um, is a two participant action frame in which an agent acts upon a patient, um, resulting in a change of state, namely uh, the death of those patients. Whereas in the transitive verb, um, <clears throat> we have just a one participant action frame in which the in which attention is only given to the undergoer of the action, in this case, uh, the Palestinian protesters, um, without any reference to the cause behind um, that outcome. Um, agentless passives do something fairly uh, similar. 
So here you get reports from the BBC on the same uh, events. Uh, Gaza clashes 52 Palestinians killed on deadliest day since 2014. Now here we find we do find the transitive verb kill as opposed to the intransitive die, but in the agentless passive form, we're not told who did the killing. That is the agent is omitted from the linguistic representation. We find the same in the Wall Street Journal. Schools killed as Palestinian protests uh, US embassy opening in Jerusalem. Again, we don't find who is um, who has done the killing. In critical discourse analysis, we call this mystification because it obscures for the reader uh, the, the agent of the killing. We can represent it diagrammatically uh, as something uh, like the following, where it's only uh, the, the death of the Palestinians. We know they might, with, with killing in contrast to dying, we know there must have been a cause, there must have been an agent that brought about the killing, but they're not selected for sort of focal attention. Nominalizations also work the same way or similar way. Nominalizations are, uh, are where we get verbs being turned into nouns. And in the example here, you have clashes leave 16 Palestinians dead or mass protests uh, left dozens dead. Uh, and what we find here then is, is clash is normally a verb, but in treating it as a, as a noun, uh, then clashes themselves are responsible for the death of Palestinians rather than um, a participant in those clashes. So again, it obscures uh, the agency, it obscures uh, the person or group of persons actually responsible um, for bringing about these deaths. Just another example of uh, nominalizations, this time from the Wall Street Journal, uh, doing very similar thing. Clashes over new US embassy in Jerusalem leaves dozens dead. Clashes between Palestinian protesters and Israeli military uh, left dozens dead. So again, it doesn't tell you that it was the, 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 the sh firing of shots by the Israeli military uh, that killed the Palestinian protesters, but the, the, the clashes themselves somehow uh, resulted in uh, deaths. Um, leaving open the possibility, for example, that they were accidental. OK, <clears throat> I'd like to have a look at uh, metaphors uh, as well. Uh, and I've got uh, two examples, two types of uh, metaphors to, to talk to you about. Fire metaphors on the one hand and um, militarising or, or war metaphors on the other hand. So let's start with fire metaphors. Uh, and here, the, the context I'm looking at is the London riots that took place in 2011 as a response uh, to the killing of, of uh, Mark Duggan. Uh, so here you find uh, these metaphors are interesting because, because during the London riots, there, there was real fire. Buildings were set alight and so on. And in some sense, uh, the metaphor therefore may be topic triggered. But in the language, when they're referring to the actual political protests, these, these uh, references to uh, fire are metaphorical. So a metaphor is in language uh, an expression in which uh, or through which I should say uh, one sort of area of knowledge or experience um, is used to make sense of another area of knowledge or experience. Uh, and in the case of political protests, then political protests are, are the target domain and we may use different meta different metaphorical frames um, as a source domain that we map on to the target domain to help us make sense of them. So what we find here in a riot that engulfed North London was sparked when a teenage girl threw a rock at police, it was claimed last night, um, <clears throat> is language, is vocabulary belonging to the domain of fire, but here being appropriated or borrowed to talk about political protest. And with that, uh, that metaphorical expression in language, a whole bundle of knowledge around uh, fire is brought to bear in understanding uh, the political situation or, or the social situation of this protest. Uh, so uh, the, the, the kind of metaphor triggers um, or activators in, in, this, uh, uh, in this example are engulf, um, but also sparked. 
Uh, we can also see um, other examples um, that are slightly less obvious, but nevertheless are candidates for uh, in indicators of, of the fire frame, uh, fire metaphor. So in words like spread, further riots in London as violence spread across England. Uh, rioting has spread across London uh, with unrest flaring um, in other English cities. Um, <clears throat> flaring clearly um, related to fire, uh, but spread also since it, you know, fires Typically, other things, of course, spread like disease, uh, but fires are also things that spread. Political protests can't literally spread. Um, and again, we can consult um, a corpus of English uh, um, as a reference corpus to check this kind of analysis. And he here's what we find for engulf. And the typical kinds of things that engulf other things are flames, heat, fire, smoke, and so on. So things associated with fire. This gives us grounds for interpreting um, these kind of expressions that we see here uh, and in the previous slide invo involving uh, engulf um, as as fire metaphors where the domain of fire is is brought to bear in our understanding of political protests now when we think about what fire might do what fire metaphors might do in uh, in these contexts well, they serve to uh, increase a sense of uh, danger and destruction and devastation and so on. Um, they also kind of naturalize um, political protests um, um, since fire, when fire spreads, it's a kind of natural phenomenon, whereas political protests are not natural. They're, they are uh, deliberate, intentional expressions of um, political dissatisfaction. Um, but one of the other things they might do is justify uh, responses to uh, fire, to protests that are somehow equivalent to the way you would respond to fires. Now, what do we all know about the way you respond to a fire? Well, if it's a large fire, you call the fire brigade who come along with fire engines and extinguish the fire using water. The kind of counterpart of that in the area of political protests would be the use of water cannon to quell um, civil um, unrest. So we might expect that fire metaphors when used to talk about political protest would heighten or increase the acceptability or legitimacy of police using water cannon um, to control uh, future political protests. And indeed, if you test this analysis or hypothesis experimentally, that is what you find. Participants given a text about a political protest that contain no metaphors um, uh, compared to participants um, uh, given a different text um, that was only different in the uh, extent to which it contained fire metaphors, uh, results in um, a, a greater perceived legitimacy for using water cannon. That is, participants exposed to fire metaphors in media reports of political protest are more likely uh, to see the use of water cannon as an acceptable way of responding to political protests than participants who read a literal version of the same text that did not contain fire metaphors. Um, <coughs> I'll, I'll close by uh, looking at one uh, further metaphor, which is war metaphors uh, in the context of political uh, protest. So um, here's just an example, London under siege. Uh, here you have a sort of indirect metaphor in that there's no mention of war specifically, uh, just like in Gulf doesn't uh, directly mention fire, but it's suggestive of uh, fire, uh, of war here. It belongs under siege is a term uh, that belongs to the domain of war. Um, and as Fridolfsson writes, war framing establishes the plausibility for military intervention when dealing with political protests. So just as fire metaphors establish the plausibility for, for using uh, water cannon based on a correspondence with, with, with fire engines in, uh, in the fire frame, um, so uh, war type language here paves the way for uh, military responses to political protest. 
Um, here's a, another example. This again um, uh, relates back to the uh, London riots, and, and here we have a, a different metaphor being used for the London riot. Croydon is a war zone. This is a direct metaphor. It mentions um, uh, mentions the term war. Uh, and the image as well is suggestive of war footage. Think about um, images you might have seen, particularly rolling camera footage of the bombardment of Iraq and so on. That that this this kind of image here um, uh, borrows, we call it interdiscursively, uh, from the genre of uh, from news reporting of um, of aerial bombardment. Um, and in that sense, the image as well as the language are working together to create a sense of the protests as as being warlike. Just to take you to another uh, context using the same uh, metaphor. Uh, this is uh, this is from the uh, uh, Gilets Jaunes or Yellow Vests protests in Paris. Uh, and in the language, again, we find reference to, to war. So we get Paris becomes a war zone as police clash with protesters. Um, and we also find uh, it'll be quite small for you to read, but uh, dozens of, of cars were set on fire and shops and restaurants looted uh, as a protest by more than 10,000 members of the Gilets Jaunes Yellow Vests movement uh, turned the centre of uh, the French capital into a war zone last night. Um, and there's also a reference to battling as well as officers battled rioters um, in the byline at the top. Um, but again, it's not just the uh, the language, but also the image here that um, that suggests uh, a, a war framing for political protests. And the language is fairly direct; it explicitly mentions war, but it doesn't reference any particular war. The image is more indirect, but it is also at the same time more specific in that it alludes to um, a very particular. Battle. And some of you might already uh, uh, be anticipating what I'm going to show you on the next slide, because this image bears a striking resemblance uh, to this image, uh, which, of course, shows the very famous barricade scene um, in the stage production of Victor Hugo's novel uh, Les Miserables, which was set between the 1815 uh, defeat of Napoleon at uh, Waterloo and the 1832 June rebellion in Paris. This is the sort of second French revolution. Um, and that image in turn is based on a very famous painting, uh, Eugene Delacroix's Liberty Leading the People, uh, which depicts Marianne, the national symbol of the French Republic, personifying the goddess of liberty, um, a painting commemorated in celebration of the July Revolution of 1830. So what you have uh, in the in the text here uh, is an intertextual rather than interdiscursive, an intertextual reference um, to a very specific um, uh, event um, in 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 French poli political history, um, but a, a battle. So the image also uh, is contributing to the framing of the protest as a battle or as a war. Um, and I'll just. Um, conclude with, with two last slides. Um, the relationship between uh, the government and the media is, is very complex uh, and is a matter for media scholars and sociologists more than it is for linguists. Um, but there's no doubt that uh, this type of protest paradigm, this pattern of reporting uh, in which um, protests are, uh, in which the, the sort of violent and destructive nature of protests um, is attended to in greater detail than the political causes behind the protests, contributes to creating a context in which governments can introduce bills such as the Police Crime Sentencing and Court Bill, which went through its, which passed through its second reading at the House of Commons yesterday, and which, if it enters into legislation to become an act of parliament, um, will represent a hugely draconian. Um, measures in relation to political protests, uh, bestowing police uh, with with really the right to prevent uh, public assembly, uh, and uh, and therefore curbing um, collective displays of political discontent. So to wrap up, 
media representations of political protests focus on their violent and destructive aspects. This is a general pattern of representation reflected not only in the content of the coverage, but in the details of the linguistic structure, including choices in lexis, grammar and metaphor. And in the last couple of slides, I've also shown you in the images that the newspapers use. Variation between newspapers reflects different ideological perspectives, different attitudes toward the relationship between state and citizen and different attitudes towards the legitimacy of political protests. Images, as I've suggested, are also important for framing uh, through the subtle interdiscursive and intertextual links that they make to other images or other types of images. And with that, thank you very much. And I'm very happy to take any questions.